where are we in terms of personalized medicine? Uh, you know, what is the future of personalized medicine? Um, and what, and you know, if it is around the corner, then you know, why, why aren't we seeing more of it in use today? In general, medicine is standardized to the average person and you're not average, I'm not average, and really nobody's average. So depending on not just your weight and your age, but also your metabolism and your genetics, your allergies, you're not necessarily getting what you're supposed to be getting. And the difference can, can be five times. So you can, if you happen to think, gee, I often react to medicines a little more strongly than other people, that could be that you've got five times the standard dose and your body's just screaming, that's not really right for me. And that can affect really important medications like Valium and morphine derivatives in the hospital, but also antibiotics and, and depression drugs, all sorts of stuff. So the worry is you're taking somebody's bad guess of what you ought to take when it's now possible to do so much better. And there's a, a national initiative run by NIH called All of Us that's working to personalize medicines. And I think that in pharmacy delivery of medicines is going to be able to do a better match of what that patient actually needs. You talked about pharmaceutical delivery or and, and so I'd love to kind of understand your role, which is in, you know, which is in 3D printing of drugs. So if you can kind of just even talk about that, like what what does that even look like? It's standard customization in a pharmacy right now is compounding. So that's a, the old method is a mortar and pestle and you squish together the, the ingredients so that they create a pill that can deliver as you, as you request. But the promise of 3D printing is that you can pretty close to real manufacturing craft those custom dosages and you can use the structure of 3D printing to make essentially tiny little cages that will deliver the drug doses inside, including at different rates. So you can have controlled release and not even just of one dose, but controlled re release with different little cages. You can create poly pills. So for somebody who has a complex medication regimen, they, different drugs can be inside different levels and the dissolving coating or, or layers of coating can release different drugs and different parts of it at different times in this tiny little internal structure. And you end up with this carefully customized drug that doesn't have that yellow dye that the patient is allergic to and is shaped right so that it's easy to swallow and releases at the right rates for their metabolism. And that's customized, but controlled. It's simple uh, because a lot of the work has, you know, has been done by, by, you know, leaders like yourself and, and it's better for the patients. So where is the resistance then in moving into, um, into this area of 3D printing of drugs? So FDA has approved so far one commercially produced 3D printed drug from Apresha, and that is because of its particular release profile. So FDA has gone through the process of saying, we like this idea, we're interested in this idea, we're ready to approve, and we've approved one manufacturing facility, but what's stopping them and USP and Big Pharma overall as a whole? How do you know this print is gonna be the same as that print? How do I know that these ingredients are what we said they were going to be? And pharma is, you know, in a regulated industry, you don't like to change things unnecessarily because you need to be sure that things don't vary when they're not supposed to. So you don't just embrace and say, oh, change. You say yeah. variance is a bad thing. Let's be thoughtful about rolling out new ways, new methods, new unpredictable problems. So that quality management issue in pharma, as they move toward embracing quality by design, 
process analytical technology, design of experiments, where you can predict through the right analytical methods what you're going to get and then not end up with a lot of waste and say, oh, we checked it afterwards and it was terrible, so we threw it all out. A really cool technique usable in all sorts of, of science of shooting a light into things and then measuring what light comes back. So if you think about the metaphor of, say, when bees go out and look at flowers and they come back and do a dance explaining what they got, so the light comes back and does a dance essentially that says, well, these are the chemical bonds I ran into. And that dance of what the light did on the way back tells you important things about the chemistry of what it just shown its light on. So all of the, exactly the questions you want to ask are pretty conveniently answered with a technique that's light-based. And now, I mean, it used to be that this is a serious lab instrument that uh, you know you needed a, a whole lot of second derivative calculus to figure out what those curves meant. And now much of that is done up front. The analytical packages are separate. The spectrometers themselves are available in these tiny little beautiful things that nearly fit in, into your into your not just smartphone but into your smartwatch that will bounce that light and give an answer. So for our purposes, they're now inexpensive enough, high quality enough to fit into the 3D printer. Nobody's quite done it yet. We're just starting. But that means that the quality management is right there. So it says, uh-oh, that layer didn't stick together right. Or if this is going to be a tablet that you can cut in half, you better make sure that, that the ingredients on this half are the same as the ingredients on that half. And the light will tell you all of that. So those kinds of monitoring via spectroscopy can be used not only in the shift from batch to continuous manufacturing in a big facility, but also right there in front of you to do that customiz customized, personalized medicine. Do you think it's going to be sort of like new pharmaceutical companies coming out and moving into this space? Or do you see this as also not a pivot, but, you know, current pharmaceutical companies also opening up units that are, you know, that are now focused on this? You see a mix. So it, it's sometimes pharma companies will buy their innovation or foster enough incubators so that they're invested a little bit and they grow it, but outside of their of their core operations. It, it's interesting to see often the biologics divisions are where the innovators are, but then if you have, as this is, innovations that are mostly focused for the moment on small molecules. The innovator people are on the other side, but they're kind of watching over and say, oh, ooh, that 3D printing stuff, we love, love innovation. And while it isn't for biologics at this point, we're excited about it too. So it depends on, on how well constructed the big pharma company is in order to, to catch that excitement, those kinds of how do we embrace an emerging technology. So what we're seeing is that most of the of the serious pharma companies have a little group of people saying, "Ooh, we're tracking this. We we see that, you know, which of our blockbuster drugs could be better delivered with a 3D printed version, but the they're also separately generally looking at customization and only now beginning to think, well, if those two things came together, what would our hurdles be? And their hurdles for now are, we really care about quality management. What have you got to offer that solves that problem for us? And the other thing to say is that absolutely every pharma company uses spectroscopy for quality management of incoming raw materials um, and uh, process technology already and taking that talent and applying it to this new challenge it shouldn't be particularly difficult for them because they all understand what it is and what it does for them. In the space that we're in, which is data, health data privacy, patient data ownership, um, you know, security, privacy, transparency, consent, you know, these are all really big topics when we start moving into big data. And, you know, this 
3D printing and customization, that's all connected to the big data world. So, right. So in this yeah. case, the data are the drug, right? So it's not just patient data that you're thinking about. It, at this moment, if you have the file that says this is how the drug is printed and this is what it's made out of, that is the drug. So the security of that information and the precision and so, you know, if somebody hacks in there and says, you know, quadruple the dose, that that's a cybersecurity problem writ large. So that's essentially the scary equivalent of, hey, you can take over self-driving cars. Bowhead, we, you know, we use Ethereum blockchain, we use a private, a customized Ethereum blockchain um, and smart contract technology. And that's what allows us to um, essentially give patients data ownership and allow all that data to be de-identified, fully encrypted um, and, you know, safely and securely stored um, through this decentralized or distributed ledger. And um, it makes me think a lot about the role of blockchain in, in, you know, in the 3D printing of drugs, because you can, you know, you can, everything can be tagged with the proof of origin, you know, and use, and it's, it's completely immutable, right? So you can prevent fraud from taking place. Curious what your thoughts are on this technology and how it might uh, have an impact in, in your space. So now if a prescription is targeted, not just to what ails you, but more things about you, then that prescription contains much more personalized information. And it, it's a good idea to have a blockchain on say your pharmaceutical information so that you can carry it from one place to one pharmacy to another um, and trust that it got there safely and that nobody did anything bad to it. But once that contains genetic information about you, blockchain is really nicely targeted to having a lot of players, not all of them perfectly trusted but all of them needing access to perfectly trustable information. And this is a case where it's information about you. Other people need to be able to get access to it. You care about who's allowed to touch it, change it, and you definitely need a record of it. So that's a pretty decent case for a blockchain application. So blockchain is, is a pretty nice way to say, this is trustable but we don't let you in to our internal systems. We just let you see, touch, and have data about your part. That's right. That was, yeah, really, really well articulated. And so maybe maybe that's it because we see that, you know, there's a lot more openness to this technology, to blockchain technology um, in pharmaceutical companies. We see pharmaceutical companies, you know, opening up their own units. And, you know, and not all, but, you know, at least doing some R&D in this space. How far are we from the future of personalized medicine, which encompasses, you know, all of these sort of innovative technologies in the, in the, in the digital space? Depends on, on which part of the elephant you touch in order to ask that question. So if you look at the, vaccine trials, for example, it's a big deal to say, you know, we ought to be testing on a diverse population in the dozen different ways that diversity is important in medicine. And if we don't do that, then you don't really know how this is going to work on every relevant segment of the population. So that level feels like we should have figured this out a while ago. And yet, uh, there's, there's plenty of, of excitement around the innovations in personalized medicine. I, I mentioned NIH's All of Us initiative. Uh, you see that now every physician is trained on, you know, if you say, I, I, I'm concerned about my CYP450, they don't look at you and say, you're what? <laughs> so there's some movement forward. You know, you see oh, we, this pharmacy will make you a custom blister pack, or we'll take a bunch of conventional drugs and we'll put them in little spots so you know what to take when. And that's nice, and that's kind of custom. But you understand when you look at that, that it's still not really grasping the full potential of offering what you need 
when you need it, tracked correctly so that everybody can, can manage what to get you next time and figure out what worked for you. Part of the digital challenge is also compliance. Clinical trials are in part expensive because compliance is tricky. And you know, if a doctor doesn't know that you didn't take it and changes your dose because it didn't work, that's an information problem, but it's a medical problem too. So the intersection of medicine and information is, is the future for both of us. And, and we see it coming together in, look, here's an information-based object that's custom 3D printed that is essentially information embodied and turned into medicine. As Sharon said, in the 3D printing of drugs movement, data is the drug. So safety and security must be top of mind. Big Questions is intended to help all of us envision a better healthcare system for the digital age. If you like what you see, please follow along our journey. Thank you.